Okay, so we're gonna move on and start section three. Uh, everyone did pretty good on the test. Again, I need to work on making it harder, so just be ready for that. Just kidding. Um, actually, the the kidney stuff is actually pretty pretty complicated. So we'll probably uh, camp out here and spend uh, a bit of time. Um, I'm not kidding you around when I say that though. <laughs> Okay, um, so section three is going to cover mainly uh, the renal physiology. We'll talk about the urinary system. Uh, we'll talk about digestive stuff, metabolism, and then finally reproductive uh, endocrinology. Uh, if you want to see me get really awkward real fast, it'll be during that lecture. So, okay, so today we're going to look at renal physiology. We'll look at uh, things like GFR, uh, glomerular filtration. We'll talk about this tubular processing. Talk about how we regulate fluids in the kidneys, and then uh, we'll look at uh, some of the regulatory mechanisms that go into play here. So again, we already talked about some of these. We covered some of the cardio stuff, so like the renin-angiotensin system is going to be integral to uh, kind of maintaining kidney flow. Um, we'll look at a lot of that. Aldosterone is going to come up here again, so this will all be very, very important. So um, today we're going to look at the, some of the structures and functions of the kidney, look at GFR, um, how reabsorption, uh, secretion, excretion of uh, fluids is going to happen here, and then look at things like plasma clearance and finally blood pressure and how that's going to play a role in uh, regulating renal physiology. Okay. Here's a simplified diagram of the nephron. We're going to come back to this picture pretty frequently, um, but it's good to have a understanding of how the different flows are going to be occurring here. Where is water being reabsorbed? Where is uh, sodium being reabsorbed? And we'll look at a lot of these in much more detail, but to have a good understanding of how um, the nephrons are going to be controlling things like concentration of the urine or not concentrating the urine, as, as the case may be, how different hormones are going to affect this is really, really important to understanding uh, how the kidneys are functioning, and especially when they go wrong, right? So this is the big thing is that, you know, when you have patients who have poor kidney function, what's causing that? Like, what are the, the derangements that are happening here, and what kind of downstream effects do you get from that. So we're going to look at these in much more detail. So again, the nephron is going to be kind of this, uh, the main kind of functional unit of the kidney. We'll see how this kind of um, is going to lie within the kidney itself uh, and is functional, but I'm sure some of you guys have covered this previously. We'll look at all the different points of it. Um, you know, things like the, the proximal, the distal convoluted tube, the loop of Henle. We'll see how all those are going to be functioning um, distinctly, a little bit differently from one another and how it's going to lead us to regulating electrolyte balance, fluid balance, all that good stuff. Uh, we'll look at growth structure of the urinary system first. Basically, you'll see uh, everyone should have two kidneys for the most part. Maybe someone was very nice and donated one of theirs, but most people should have two. Um, it'll be connected up through the ureters, down to the bladder, and then finally through the urethra where uh, the uh, urine can be eliminated. So uh, essentially when looking at the kidney more specifically, you'll notice we have the, the renal cortex, which would be kind of this outward uh, area here. We're gonna have the, the renal medulla or medulla here. And then we'll look at these renal pyramids specifically. And so this is kind of where a lot of the nephrons are gonna be located at. So you can see kind of an enlarged one here, um, how it will be lying. There's how the glomerulus will be kind of be up here close to the cortex. And then a lot of them, um, we'll talk about the, the function of having these uh, the loops kind of descending down farther into uh, the medulla there. We'll look at the uh, minor calyxes. This is where a lot of the collecting ducts of the nephrons are going to be kind of joining up to one another uh, as it starts to uh, collect the urine together, going to these more major calyxes here, and then finally over into the renal pelvis, where it can then be excreted out through uh, the ureter. Okay. Um, we'll talk a lot about osmolality and uh, how that differs in different areas of the kidney. Uh, if you had to guess, or if anyone's covered it before, how do you think the osmolarity of the, the cortex compares to the, the medulla? Which one's higher, do you think? Awesome, you guys don't know this, and I'll show you uh, in great detail. <laughs> Basically, the medulla you're going to find is going to be much more concentrated. It's going to be much more, have much higher osmolarity uh, the deeper you go into the kidney. And that's going to be super, super important for helping us to regulate how concentrated the urine is going to be when it comes out. Because, obviously, if we are excreting too much urine, uh, that can be a problem, because what could happen at that point? Dehydration, you can have fluid imbalance or electrolyte imbalances where you could be losing certain uh, electrolytes like potassium or sodium. Um, if you don't have enough elimination of urine, what could happen? Hypervolemia, you can have fluid overload, um, and there's gonna be lots of different conditions that can cause either one of these cases, but uh, the ability to concentrate the urine is, is an important concept to understand, and we'll get into much more detail on that as we go forward. Here you can kind of see uh, contrast being injected into the bladder and how that will go up through the ureters and connect it to the kidneys. Uh, I don't know why that's not showing up. Okay, so we're uh, basically you can see the location here of uh, the kidneys and how they reside uh, within the body there. 
<clears throat> and of course, what sits on top of the kidneys? The adrenal glands, right? So you can see the adrenal glands. And of course, um, one of the major hormones that gets released by the adrenal glands is, and it affects the kidneys. Aldosterone. Aldosterone, yeah. So aldosterone is going to be really, really important in helping to regulate um, some of our uh, urine concentrating abilities. Okay. Um, you can see here how the blood flow to the kidney is going to be uh, uh, situated. Again, you're going to have the renal artery, which is going to be coming off of uh, the aorta here. It's going to be uh, projecting further and further uh, towards the cortex. And so you're going to notice that there's uh, kind of an order to the, the veins and arteries we're going to be talking about here. And eventually, they're all going to be leading out through the renal vein, which is going to be coming um, through the inferior vena cava. That's kind of where all the blood is going to eventually circulate back out. Um, but of course, all the stuff in the middle is the important bits. And so we're going to get into more detail on that in just a second. But notice how all this is kind of situated right here uh, around the pelvis of the, the kidney. Okay. Um, so basically, when looking at the, the urinary system, we can uh, look at, you know, obviously urine is going to be made within the, the kidneys themselves, but once that's left, once it leaves the nephron, it's going to be draining into the minor calluses, going, again, the minor calluses kind of be here, going to the more major calluses, it's going to be uh, going through the renal pelvis, into the ureter, and then they go down into the bladder, and then it's going to be exiting through the body of the bladder, out into the urethra, and then we have elimination of that. Okay. And of course, the urine is going to be transported through here, through the ureters, via peristalsis. Do you guys remember what that is? Basically kind of have that, that, uh, that systematic contraction of those muscles in order to push the fluid along um, to get it down to the bladder, and eventually it'll end up going through uh, the urethra. So we'll look at how that's going to be regulated in just a few minutes. Okay. So looking at how the uh, ureters are going to be connecting up through to the bladder, so you kind of notice there's this uh, area here. Uh, called the trigone. Uh, basically, it's kind of triangle-shaped uh, bit of mucosa. And you notice here how the, the ureters are going to basically kind of run along the backside of the bladder and then going to kind of outlet here in kind of two uh, areas there of the trigone. Okay? Um, the bottom portion of here of this mucosa is going to lead out into uh, through the urethra, essentially. Um, now, importantly, what do you think this type of tissue is of the bladder? muscle, right? smooth muscle. Um, we're going to call this the detrusor muscle, and this is going to be important for forcing uh, the, the urine out through the urethra. Uh, there's also a couple other muscles as well. There's these sphincters uh, that are going to be really important for helping to regulate outflow of urine. So we're going to have the internal sphincter here. Is this smooth or uh, more striated muscle? You guys think? This is also going to be smooth muscle, so this is going to be under involuntary control, but then you're going to have this external urethra, and what do you guys think about this one? Yeah, so it's going to be a voluntary muscle, which is good because if it was involuntary, you guys would all be wearing diapers right now, right? So again, so this is going to be under uh, our own kind of conscious control. This is going to be more strident muscle. Uh, we're going to look at that balance between how we can regulate that so we can urinate when we want to and hold it in when we don't want to. Notice here, uh, especially for men, you're going to have the prostate kind of uh, encircling the urethra. Why is that important? What happens if that prostate gets too big? Yeah, it's going to obstruct that urine flow. So this is a big problem for, for guys when they end up having um, uh, too much kind of hypertrophy of that tissue. Uh, you can end up seeing that the prostate will kind of clamp down on the urethra and impede uh, uh, urine flow. Uh, there's a really good like, SNL commercial where they do like a fake uh, uh, BPH medication. It's benign prostatic hyperplasia. Uh, basically, they're using like a big garden hose and showing little, little bits of spurts of, of water versus like, you know, after the drug, you have a huge outflow of uh, you flow through that garden hose. But anywho, so the prostate's important there. BPH will be uh, obviously a big thing, especially for your older male patients. Okay, so I mentioned that trigone here. This is basically an area of kind of mucosa. It's not really muscle necessarily, but this is where the ureter is going to be uh, entering into the bladder. Um, that's how it kind of run, runs along the, the backside of that mucosa there. And then eventually we're going to be leading out through the, uh, the internal sphincter and then finally the external sphincter, which is going to be um, basically where we have that kind of voluntary control of those muscles. Here you can kind of see the internal sphincter uh, versus the uh, external sphincter, which is here. You see the external sphincter, and then uh, here you can notice right here. All right, so of course, obviously, there's uh, some big differences um, between like the urethral length between guys and girls. This can also influence things like how likely they are to get infections and, and other things like that uh, that can be uh, you know, important for your you know, different gendered patients. All right. 
So uh, basically the kidney, we're going to look at having uh, kind of two distinct regions. We mentioned the cortex, which is going to be kind of the outer layer here. Um, this is where a lot of that, uh, that blood flow is going to be terminating uh, to enter into the nephron. Uh, and then you're going to see the uh, medulla here where a lot of the urine is going to be kind of collecting. This is also where you're going to see a lot of like those loops of Henle, which we'll mention, um, talk about later, how those are going to be important for kind of dipping down deeper into the, uh, the medulla because this is where we have a lot of that concentrating ability because the osmolarity is going to be very high in this area. It's a lot of, a lot of salt. Um, a, lot of, a lot of osmolites are going to be uh, located here. All right, so this is a good picture here. Um, so basically what we're going to see is that the cortex, again, being the outer area of the, the kidney, you're going to have the, the medulla, the outer zone versus the inner zone. There's here you have the collecting ducts, so a lot of different nephrons are going to be kind of emptying the urine into these uh, components. Now, what is this? Uh, what would you call this? You know what that's called? The glomerulus, right? So glomerulus is where the primary filtration is going to be occurring here. Um, we're also going to talk about things like the afferent and the efferent arterioles and how those are going to be supplying the glomerulus. Um, does anyone know the difference between the afferent and the efferent arterioles? Which one's heading into the glomerulus? Now the afferent's going to be heading in, and then the efferent will be heading back out. That's important to remember because um, we're going to see there's different hormonal control for those uh, to cause vasodilation or constriction, which can lead to big changes in your renal uh, blood flow. Okay. We'll talk about those are a little bit later, uh, especially with medications. This is a really, really big thing to understand uh, so you can know how those are going to be affecting uh, blood flow there. So anyway, uh, also notice you're going to have, uh, especially here with these, um, we call these juxtamedullary nephrons because they're able to kind of project down with this loop of Henle into uh, the medulla. Notice they're going to have a pretty good uh, vascularity here. Basically, after the efferent arterial kind of comes off of the, the glomerulus, you're going to have what we call the vasa recta. And that's going to be able to uh, help with this concentration of um, solutes. We're going to see how that's going to play a role as well. But these are really important for concentrating urine. Um, you're also going to have some of these cortical nephrons, which are not going to be really kind of uh, jutting down so far into the medulla. So these are not going to be as important for uh, the concentrating of the urine. Again, they're all going to end up in the, uh, entering into the collecting duct, which will going to lead it out to eventually uh, through the ureters, uh, to the bladder, to the urethra, and then out of the body. Okay. Looking specifically at renal function. All right, so what do the kidneys do for us? We already kind of alluded to some of these. So uh, one, they're able to get rid of a lot of waste products for us. Uh, foreign chemicals, drugs, we saw the excretion is uh, uh, very much reliant on kidney function in a lot of cases in, in pharmacodynamics. Um, but you can see things like urea, which is going to be a primary uh, metabolism of amino acids. So as you break down amino acids, it turns into uh, urea, which is an important thing we can uh, eliminate from the kidneys. This will be very important as well for uh, concentrating the, um, the urine. In fact, when you have very kind of like very concentrated urine, a lot of it is going to be made up of this urea that we're trying to get rid of. We'll have creatinine, which is uh, broken down from uh, muscle creatinine. Uh, so this will be important. Do you guys know what we use creatinine for? What we as clinicians use it for? Used to estimate renal function, right? We talked about creatinine clearance before. We'll see how that's going to be uh, very important due to it, the uh, way it gets reabsorbed or not reabsorbed, as the case may be. Um, uric acid ends up getting released from nucleic acids and other purines. This is really important for us when we have um, cancer patients, especially like leukemias. They're producing all these kind of immature white blood cells, and we go through and we kill them all with. Um, with uh, chemotherapy drugs, they release a lot of uh, nucleic acids that all get broken down, and so they can get really, really hyperuricemic, uh, which can be very problematic. So uric acid is another thing that we'll be eliminating. Uh, bilirubin, we know, is getting eliminated from uh, hemoglobin catabolism. We talked about that in the previous section. And then a lot of drugs uh, will be eliminated through the kidneys, either as their kind of parent compound or as some metabolites. Uh, but also things like food additives and whatnot can also be eliminated through the kidneys. Okay, um, We know that the kidneys are also playing a very important role in regulating H2O and electrolyte balances. So we can either uh, be affecting uh, not only what gets eliminated through the kidneys, but also by what we're putting into the system. Um, we'll mention uh, things like you know sensible and insensible losses and intakes into the system. You guys know what the difference between sensible and insensible things are? Yeah, we can measure sensible uh, losses or, or uh, uh, inputs, uh, but we cannot measure the insensible one. So it's like an insensible um, loss of fluid in the body. Sweat's a good one. Breathing, yeah, that's another very good one, right? But we can measure things like urine output, so that would be more of kind of a, a sensible loss there. Um, on the other hand, if you're looking at actual fluid intake, what would be like an insensible intake? Yeah, food turning into uh, just the water that is uh, within the food itself. You know, think about like vegetables and fruits and things like that. Also, uh, just the actual metabolism of the glucose into ATP. A byproduct is CO2 and 
water, right? So that water we can't really calculate either, right? So there's going to be, uh, uh, there has to be a balance there. And the kidneys really help us to regulate that balance, make sure we have um, enough, uh, you know, elimination of the waste products, but we can still um, maintain uh, our fluid balance as best we can. So um, again, this can be affected. Obviously, we know hormonal control of things like the thirst response and whatnot can be uh, can be a major determinant here. So we'll look at that as well. Um, but then looking at electrolytes of so things like sodium, chloride, potassium, calcium is really going to be integral in, in being managed by the kidneys. Um, also looking at things like hydrogen ion balance, so we can affect the acid base status of the body very. Um, significantly by either looking at hydrogen ion concentrations or looking at bicarbonate that gets lost in the kidneys, um, and then magnesium and phosphate as well, all can be uh, regulated by the kidneys themselves. And when you have patients who have uh, you know, renal failure, you have major derangements in all of these electrolytes, right? They have elevated calcium levels, their sodium and their potassium is gonna go up potentially. Um, so lots of problems that happen there. And if you have a patient who their kidneys stop working, what do you do for them? Yeah, we use an artificial one, right? So we hook them up to a dialysis machine that essentially can do the same thing for us, just uh, via outside of the body. Right? Okay. Um, again, looking at other functions of the kidneys, you'll see that they help to regulate body osmolality and also these electrolyte concentrations that I mentioned. Um, things like aldosterone is going to be really important here. Things like antidiuretic hormone is important here. Uh, ANP, which is that atrial natriuretic peptide, is going to do kind of the opposite effects there. Um, but again, we'll look at some of those uh, influences a little bit later on in the lecture and see how those are going to help us to regulate osmolality and make sure we keep everything uh, working appropriately. And then also uh, the kidneys are going to be really important in regulating arterial pressure because um, one, if you are losing too much fluid to the kidneys, that's going to deplete blood volume, which can lead you to be hypotensive. That's not good. Um, but also it's going to have a direct influence on the renin angiotensin aldosterone system, which also has a big effect on helping to uh, regulate blood pressure, right? Because we said angiotensin two is that vasoconstrictive or dilating. Very intense vasoconstrictor. So we see that helps with blood pressure. That will also help to increase release of things like antidiuretic hormone and aldosterone. So you'll see um, down the line how all these can have a major role here. And the way that it works is that the kidneys, uh, and when they detect lower pressure or they detect lower blood volume, they can uh, release renin in response to that. And that helps to kick off that renin angiotensin system. We'll look at that more in detail a little bit later on, but just know that that's one of the major roles uh, that we'll see with the kidneys. Okay. I mentioned uh, helps to regulate acid-base balances, so we can either excrete acids or we can help to um, excrete bicarbonate if we need to. Um, you'll see areas where bicarbonate reabsorption is uh, going to be very important. We'll also see some places where you can actually uh, alter uh, that bicarbonate uh, function and, and actually regulate, uh, using medications, we can regulate acid-base balance of the body. Um, and also, this is the only uh, means to excrete things like sulfuric acid and phosphoric acid, which we get off of like proteins. Okay, so getting rid of those acids helps to maintain that fluid balance or that acid base balance for the body. And then uh, another big thing kidneys will do is help to regulate erythrocyte production. We mentioned uh, epoetin or epo uh, is going to be one of the major hormones that the kidneys uh, release in response to having um, you know decreased blood volume, uh, things like that. We'll see the kidneys also help with uh, either secretion, metabolism, or excretion of certain hormones. Um, they play a big role in activating vitamin D uh, because, the, like, say, for instance, you take vitamin D2 or D3 orally, is that active? Is that the active form of vitamin D? No, I'm asking the question. It's probably not. Um, but uh, there's several steps that have to occur in order to activate vitamin D. So the first place happens in the liver. The second place happens in the uh, in the kidneys. So you form this 125-dihydroxy vitamin D3, uh, which is the actual active form. And so we call that calcitriol, another name for that. So if you ever see a patient who's on calcitriol, chances are they have kidney problems because they're not able to actually form their own 125-dihydroxy vitamin D. Okay, so that's one of the big things we run into is that they have issues with um, calcium homeostasis. They have issues with uh, having too much bone resorption, as we'll see as we look at calcium homeostasis a little bit later on. And then, yes, sir. Um, so it's activated in both the liver and the kidneys, or it goes to the liver and then to the kidneys? Okay. Liver, then the kidneys. Yep, so that's why if you have a patient who has uh, liver dysfunction, they may not actually get the first um, activation step. So it doesn't matter um, how good the kidneys are working, they'll never activate uh, the vitamin D. So they run into the same problem. Um, and then with the gluconeogenesis, uh, the kidneys can start to produce uh, their own uh, amount of glucose uh, from amino acids during periods like prolonged fasting. So if you weren't getting a lot of carbohydrates in the system, they can produce their own glucose. Um, kind of cover that a few sections ago. Um, but you'll see that the, the kidneys are very metabolically active. They require a lot of oxygen uh, in order to keep a lot of the active processes occurring. Um, and so it's important they have the energy sources there.
So again, regulation of uh, extracellular fluid environment in the body, including uh, regulating our blood volume. So again, how much fluid we're either getting rid of or holding on to uh, is going to be affecting blood pressure pretty directly. Um, we'll talk about waste products we're eliminating, electrolytes, and then also function, uh, helping to regulate that pH. All these are the main, main things we're going to be seeing uh, and talking about more in details to go a little bit longer into the, uh, uh, the lecture here. Okay. But first off, we're going to talk about micturation. So hopefully everyone went, took a bathroom break, otherwise you may get triggered here. Right. What is micturation? <laughs> Being, absolutely. Um, so it's important that we don't pee when we don't want to, right? Um, that lesson could be used on my daughter, but she is only one, so she's not figured that out yet. But um, you have things like the guarding reflux, like that prevents you when you sneeze or when you have a uh, cough or something like that, like trying to prevent urine from being uh, expelled from the bladder. Uh, we're going to see there's a lot of controls that go into that to, to try to regulate it uh, appropriately, right? We know that part of this is going to be under involuntary control. Uh, being controlled by this uh, Pontine Micturition Center. Um, some of it is going to be under conscious control, right? So again, if we want to hold on to urine uh, until we have an appropriate place to do dispel it, um, otherwise um, we'll see run into some problems there. Um, biggest thing you notice is that there's several different uh, nerve fibers that are going to be uh, innervating the bladder. Uh, and again, uh, basically the bladder is just that large detrusor muscle. So it's a, just a big, um, smooth muscle uh, we're going to be affecting here. Uh, notice there's going to be sympathetic innervation there's also going to be some parasympathetic innervation. Remember, what's going to be mainly released from the sympathetic nerves? Norepi is going to be one of the big things there. Um, we're going to see how that has an effect on, on urination. Um, looking at the parasympathetic fibers, these are going to be even more important for this because that's going to be releasing what? Acetylcholine, right? That's going to have, and, and what do you think acetylcholine is going to do to uh, the urination? Uh, inhibit it or promote it? So you'll see it's going to promote it, right? So the parasympathetic is going to be the main thing. It's going to be focusing on, on releasing urine from the bladder. And then you're also going to notice there's going to be some of these kind of motor fibers. Uh, they're going to be responsible uh, for causing constriction of this ex, uh, external urethra, um, external sphincter there, okay? So the internal one is going to be under involuntary control, but the external one is going to be uh, by these pudendal uh, uh, nerves. They're going to be basically able to uh, allow us to consciously control that external sphincter. But uh, there's a lot of stretch receptors in the bladder, so you're going to notice that they are going to be able to send impulses from the bladder uh, via these afferent uh, innervations in the sacral region, okay, the spinal cord. And then it goes up to the pons where you can have this uh, ponti micturition center, and we're going to look at some of the um, kind of signals that it's going to send there when we look at these, um, these contractions of the muscle. So, um, again, controlling micturition, so once you're having uh, urine being kind of carried by the ureters through peristalsis, into the bladder, you're going to start to get some kind of stretch of that, right? Uh, so basically, after the stretch information gets processed uh, up through the pond, you're going to start to see there's going to be these kind of reflex arcs that kind of come back down. And so what you notice is that uh, if you're looking at the actual pressure uh, of the, the bladder, and you're looking at the volume that's going to go up, you're going to notice these kind of these contractions that occur in response to um, stretches, right? So the stretch receptors are going to be responding to that by causing contraction of the muscle, right? And so what do you think that does in the pressure in the bladder? should go up, right? So you start to get this kind of um, this self-regenerating uh, kind of feedback mechanism here. We're going to get stronger and stronger and stronger contractions, uh, and then eventually they kind of abate and it kind of goes back down to baseline. So I guess if you ever think like you have to go to the bathroom really bad and then all of a sudden like you just don't have to go anymore if you hold it. It's kind of the same thing's happening here. There's going to be kind of a, a period where this will kind of die down, uh, and then you're going to, as the bladder starts to fill up with more urine, it'll start to get a stronger and stronger signal until eventually you're kind of battling the brain saying like, okay, close that external sphincter versus uh, all everything else kind of providing inhibitory effects there to just try to say, okay, you need to open this external sphincter, otherwise we're going to lose everything, right? So um, basically you're going to see the inhibition uh, can also be a, a occur through uh, sympathetic innervation as well. You're going to find that when you're in that kind of fight or flight response, um, more norepi there on the muscles tends to not necessarily lead to relaxation of that muscle, but kind of more inhibitory in general um, to say like, okay, well, we probably don't need to worry about urination right this moment or running away from a bear, right? Also, if you think about um, what kind of effect do you want to have on blood volume when you're in a fight or flight response? Go higher or lower? because right, your blood pressure is going up, you want to be able to pump more blood around, you typically want higher blood volume. So if you're losing, um, you know, if you're having more uh, urinary outflow, that's losing blood volume. So you can kind of think of it that way, how the sympathetics are going to be mainly inhibitory on this process here, okay? And then you can notice it's going to come through these hypogastric plexus, um, usually from the lumbar region there, um, it's going to innervate about the internal urethral sphincter, uh, and it's going to cause it to um, typically relax and, and open in those cases. 
And then the other more important thing is going to be this parasympathetic uh, activation here. Again, we were uh, mentioning it's going to be releasing uh, acetylcholine onto these muscarinic receptors. <clears throat> it's going to be coming from the sacral nerves, and it's basically going to cause that detrusor muscle to contract. Okay, So when you get to a point where you're saying, yes, I'm ready to urinate, uh, those uh, acetylcholine nerves are going to be hitting the muscarinic receptors, cause detrusor muscle contraction. Uh, and then when you have uh, inhibition of both the internal and the external sphincter, that allows for urinary outflow to occur there. Okay. The big thing here is acetylcholine is going to have a positive effect on causing micturition. Uh, usually the sympathetic innervation should inhibit it to some degree. But again, this is going to be uh, this pudendal nerve that's going to be affecting the external sphincter. Uh, this is going to be under voluntary or somatic control. Okay. All right. So again, parasympathetic nerves, and, and we see this uh, clinically. So for instance, if you had someone who had too much acetylcholine activity, so for instance, I, I mentioned organophosphates before, think kind of an old school insecticide that inhibits um, the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine. You have too much acetylcholine around, um, you get this, what we call a cholinergic toxidrome, where essentially you have too much uh, muscarinic activity. And one of the things they do is they, uh, they basically are incontinent of urine. So if you ever see someone who is having organic uh, organophosphate exposures or having cholinergic toxicity, you're going to see they're going to be lacrimating a lot. They're going to have a lot of salivation. They're also going to have a lot of urination that goes along with that, right? Just due to that parasympathetic innervation um, that is going to overcome um, the kind of voluntary control that you have over that external sphincter. Okay, so again, you can have the body kind of overriding things if the, either the bladder gets too full, there's too much pressure, um, or if you are having some other kind of influence like you know too much parasympathetic activity. Does that make sense? Okay. I mentioned um, you'll find the sympathetic neurons more in, uh, affecting things like the beta-3 receptors, which you don't see a lot of beta-3 receptors, but this is one place you may see it. And then alpha on the alpha-1, mentioned usually alpha-1 is going to be more vasoconstrictive or, or dilating. Yeah, usually more constrictive, so it's going to cause uh, smooth muscle constriction here as well, so on things like the, uh, the uh, internal sphincter. All right, so again, when you have uh, the person kind of feeling that need to urinate, um, they're gonna be able to control that your external uh, sphincter, uh, allow it to relax and open, allow for uh, expulsion of the urine. Um, that's mainly gonna be uh, through this pudendal nerve I mentioned from the sacral complex. And basically what this is gonna do, since it's more like a skeletal muscle, um, it's gonna be releasing acetylcholine onto nicotinic receptors. That's kind of the one difference there. Uh, and basically it's gonna allow for, uh, basically inhibit this process and the sphincter is gonna end up opening um, when that occurs there, okay? So normally, if you are trying to hold in the urine, you're trying to um, send more acetylcholine on these nicotinic receptors, it causes a contraction. Uh, when I am uh, ready to use the restroom, then I can go ahead and uh, inhibit that effect and allow for uh, urine to be released. Okay. All right. Um, so again, we mentioned internal urethral sphincters and be smooth muscle, involuntary control, and primarily you're going to see the parasympathetic nervous uh, nerves hitting that with uh, acetylcholine onto those muscarinic receptors and that relaxes for a dilation and opening uh, versus skeletal muscle for the external urethral sphincter under more voluntary control. Uh, there's still going to be some uh, some influences from things like the uh, you know, the, the CNS is still able to cause some inhibitory action there, but you're kind of battling it, the involuntary versus the voluntary. Hopefully you can win out, otherwise you wet yourself, which is no good, right? Okay, so any questions on the urination process? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah, so when you inhibit that, because normally if you have those nicotinic receptors being hit with acetylcholine that causes muscle contraction, right? So think about other skeletal muscle, which we'll probably talk about later on in this class. Um, but when you inhibit that, that causes less acetylcholine to hit those receptors and that causes the, the muscle to relax and open and then you can expel the urine, right? Mm, yes, yeah, inhibition that causes you, yeah. Because normally if I'm trying to uh, consciously uh, close that sphincter, I'm releasing acetylcholine onto those nicotinic receptors that causes that contraction. But then when I'm ready to go to the bathroom, then I will uh, release that. Uh, less nicotine, uh, those nicotinic receptor activation, uh, the muscle is going to relax and allow for a urinary outflow. And at the same time, you have the parasympathetic nerves releasing acetylcholine onto the muscarinic receptors that causes the detrusor muscle to clamp down, and then you can expel out the urine. So it's kind of a concentrated effort uh, between those two. Yeah, so acetylcholine from the parasympathetic nerves is going to affect the, the detrusor muscle. Uh, primarily, and you're going to see from that pudendal nerve, like that's going to be uh, acetylcholine being released onto nicotinic receptors. Everyone with me? Okay, so you can run into lots of problems with that. So obviously, if you were to say have an issue where um, the internal sphincter has been, say, stretched or it's not working properly, that can run into issues to where um, 
Uh, you can have issues of incontinence that can happen, especially with like you know someone who's like working out or if they cough or sneeze. You can have small amounts of urine being released there. So think of like like ladies after they. Uh, are, um, give birth, oftentimes a lot of things get stretched down there, uh, and that can be one of the things that it takes a hit is that internal uh, urethral sphincter. So even though they may try to be holding things in with the external, um, they don't have that full guarding reflex. That can be one problem you run into. Um, you had issues where uh, sometimes the, the nerves uh, innervating the detrusor muscle may be either overactive or underactive that can lead to uh, either holding on to too much urine and not really getting that sensation or, or uh, trying to release it too early. So we'll talk more about that in the urology section when we get to farm, um, but just know there's lots of issues that can uh, come about from that. Also, you can have issues uh, of outflow obstruction. So if you think about things like uh, nephrolithiasis or if you have like kidney stones that are developing, that can cause obstruction, especially like in the ureters and whatnot. Um, and that can all lead to issues where you're having fluid backflow up through the kidneys, which is going to be a problem uh, as we'll see as we go forward. But anyway. Looking more specifically at the renal blood vessels and how this vasculature works, um, again, you're going to start off by the renal artery coming off of the aorta. It's going to be going into these interlobar arteries. You can kind of see here. Uh, yeah, interlobar arteries. Uh, it's going to go into these uh, arcuate arteries. And then I mentioned the interlobular arteries, which you can kind of see here, uh, kind of terminating at the end. And these are then going to terminate into the afferent arterioles, which are going to head into the glomerulus. This is where the actual filtration is going to occur. It's where all the actual business of uh, urine production happens, or at least at the beginning of it as you filter it out. Uh, and then it's going to go through the efferent arterioles. This is kind of the start of the venous system. Um, then you have these paratubular capillaries. These are going to be the base of the vessels that are going to be surrounding things like the, that loop of Henle. Um, that basa recta is going to be a kind of a, a type of paratubular capillaries. Um, so these are going to be important for uh, helping with the concentration of the urine, as we'll see in a little bit. It's going to go back into interlobular veins, and then the arcuate veins, interlobar veins, and finally back to the renal vein, where it'll empty back out into the vena cava. Okay, that's a general flow of things. Um, again, really important to understand: afferent arterioles are heading into the glomerulus, efferent arterioles are going to be heading out, and then it goes into those paratubular capillaries. Okay, it's going to be important. We're talking about concentration of the blood there. When we're talking about how uh, pressure differentials are going to be occurring uh, when you have those changes uh, after filtration has happened. So we'll go into that detail in a second. All right, just another picture kind of showing you um, here in this example, here would be one of those uh, juxtamedullary uh, nephrons where basically you'd have uh, basically uh, the afferent arterial heading into the glomerulus, uh, then you have the efferent arterial, and then you have the blood vessels kind of surrounding that loop of Henle. Again, this is going to be important for electrolyte flow, water flow, uh, things like that, and then eventually lead back into the, the veins. Okay, so uh, just know how the general flow of blood is going to be happening uh, through the nephron and around the nephron, as we'll see. All right. I'm going to mention that vasa recta is that specialized blood vessels are uh, specifically around that loop of Henle. Uh, again, this is the loop of Henle. This is going to be dipping down farther into the, the medulla where you can see a lot of concentrating effects is going to happen. And we'll show that when actually looking at the urine osmolarity as you flow through. Um, but there's a lot of kind of interchange here between uh, flow of uh, electrolytes, flow of water, and we'll see how that uh, occurs over time. Okay. So we can just another picture kind of showing you the, some of the details here on, on how this is occurring, uh, eventually leading back out to the, the veins. But... All right. So again, we mentioned uh, the nephron is going to be this kind of functional unit of the kidney. Uh, each kidney uh, essentially has more than like a million nephrons associated with it. So you have quite a bit of nephrons. And in general, you have way more nephrons than you typically need at any given time. Um, so this is why you can actually have patients who can have um, kind of long-standing damage occurring over time where they're losing nephrons or losing um, uh, function of those nephrons over time. And they don't actually notice a really drop in their kidney function until you've lost maybe like half of them. Right, um, and so this is why you can have uh, people who have like bad bad diet, or if they have uncontrolled diabetes, hypertension, they can all be leading to kidney destruction over time, and they actually don't really manifest any of that kidney injury until much much later. And then at that point, once you've lost the nephrons, they're they're gone. Right, you're never going to get those back, unfortunately. Which is why we look at a lot of um, preventative things that we can do to try to keep renal function good as long as we can for patients who are, you know, say post MI or have diabetes or have hypertension. We try to hang on to that renal function as long as we can. And so that's why we'll use, uh, we use uh, the term nephroprotective. That's oftentimes what we're referring to is trying to maintain that renal function as long as we can before that eventually uh, kind of craps out on them. Because we know just with age alone, that's going to lead to decreasing kidney function as you get older and older. Right? It's just a natural part of aging. But uh, basically, the nephron is consisting of the small tubules and the associated blood vessels. Uh, the blood is going to get getting filtered here at the glomerulus. Uh, once it enters the tubules, it gets modified and then eventually leaves the tubules as urine. You see here in this collecting duct how it can be connecting up to uh, several different nephrons. Okay. okay. 
you can kind of see how, uh, looking at this renal pyramid here, you can see how uh, the nephrons are going to be situated. There's how we mentioned that the, um, the blood vessels are kind of terminating out here in the cortex, and they're going to be uh, basically uh, giving blood over to the nephrons, and then we can have that filtration that can occur and how it's going to head back out. But basically, all of this is going to be kind of terminating here deeper and deeper down to the medulla, where it can be eventually uh, sent out to the, the minor calyx and then eventually out the, the ureter. All right. So the glomerulus, or this Bowman's capsule, is going to be uh, what basically surrounds the glomerulus. So there's going to be notice how it's kind of um, it's kind of big jumble of blood vessels. It's kind of very uh, kind of not torturous, but I should say turbulent uh, area of blood flow that allows for a lot of the filtration to happen here. Um, basically, the filtrate is going to be the stuff that gets filtered through the glomerulus is what's going to eventually uh, turn into urine. Basically, um, it's going to become this renal corpuscle passing into the proximal convoluted tubule. Which you can see here, this will be considered the proximal convoluted tubule. It's kind of stretched out here, so it looks uh, straight. But here's another example of what that's going to look like. Uh, we'll talk about the details of how and what is being absorbed here. Uh, and then eventually it's going to pass through the descending and then eventually ascending loop of Henle. Notice here is going to be a thin and a thick segment of the ascending loop of Henle. So this is going to be important to distinguish what's happening uh, differently between these different por portions of it. And then after the loop of Henle, it's going to go into this distal convoluted tubule. And then finally, it's going to go into uh, the collecting duct. Um, basically, you're going to notice that there's going to be some overlap here between kind of these cortical uh, collecting duct versus the collecting duct as again gets further down into um, kind of further down into the medulla, but we'll look at some of those details there in just a second. And then finally, once that urine is, is finally formed, it can uh, empty out into that minor calyx. All right, so again, just a general flow, again, Bowman's capsule through the glomerulus to the proximal convoluted tubule, descending loop of Henle, the ascending loop from the thin to the thick segment, that distal convoluted tubule, and finally the collecting duct. So the general flow of urine uh, before it's getting sent out to the uh, ureter. Okay, so looking more uh, specifically at glomerular filtration, is kind of where we get more into the weeds of kidney function. So a couple terms we're going to use. Uh, filtration is going to be specifically referring to uh, the blood that gets filtered in the glomerulus, uh, all the, the fluid basically coming out of there. We'll call this the filtrate. All right? um, we'll get some more details on why we're able to filter fluids out and electrolytes and things through the glomerulus in just a second. Um, you can have a process called reabsorption, where things that are sent out into the nephron can then be reabsorbed back into the bloodstream. Some things can be secreted from the blood back out into the nephron. So that can occur. And then there can be excretion when you're finally leaving uh, out as urine, right? So after that point, once it's kind of formed urine, once in the bladder, you can't really do a whole lot with it at that point. You can't really reabsorb a whole lot of solutes or anything like that uh, from that point. You're going to find that some substances are going to be almost completely reabsorbed, even though they get very well filtered. So some examples of this like glucose. Typically, you will filter glucose very easily from the glomerulus, but you have very good reabsorption of it which is good because you don't want to have a lot of extra glucose in the urine. Um, you're going to have uh, some things which will be not filtered at all, but can be secreted. And then you're going to be some things that are just going to get filtered and won't ever be uh, reabsorbed at all. So we're going to look at some of those details. Um, some of them can be very useful to us uh, from a therapeutic standpoint, and we'll look at those details in a minute. But essentially, you're going to see the excretion of fluid from the, the kidneys is going to equal to that filtration minus whatever is reabsorbed, plus whatever actually gets actively secreted, right? And this is all going to be occurring in those paratubular capillaries here as well, right? All right. So looking at the glomerular corpuscle, so again, the capillaries here, uh, the glomerulus are going to be fenestrated. You guys know what fenestrated means? Yeah, it's got like holes in it. It's kind of um, has lots of, of gaps in it where it allows for things like water and also solutes to leave. It's kind of large pores. You notice here, like this would be one of the fenestrations. Um, you're going to notice there's kind of three areas. You have this endothelium, which is going to have kind of the, the fenestration with holes in it that allows for a lot of the solutes and water to flow through. You have this basement membrane, and then you're going to have this epithelium. This is kind of made up of these podocytes. You're going to notice these little guys here. They have this kind of long legs sticking off of them. That's where you get those uh, the name podocytes. But essentially what we see is that water can come through, electrolytes can come through for the most part, um, but you're going to notice that blood cells um, and molecules that are too large cannot get through these uh, membranes, which is a good thing because you typically don't want blood in your urine, most likely. Um, and then also large plasma proteins cannot get through. So think about things like albumin, right? They can't actually get through there, and you shouldn't really see a whole lot of protein in the urine. Um, otherwise, that is indicative of a problem, right? That's usually not a good thing when you see protein in the urine. Uh, the reason for that is, is that basement membrane actually carries a negative charge, right? So things like sodium, which is small molecules, got a positive charge, it's able to get through pretty easily. 
um, but you can have things like albumin, which is a large protein, has a lot of negative charges on it. Um, it's not going to be able to cross there because it's going to get repelled by those negative proteins in, in the basement membrane. Okay, That's usually a good thing because we want to hold on to proteins in the blood as best we can. And so um, there are disease states that occur. Um, have you guys ever heard of minimal change disease? Something you might hear about uh, being referred to some of your kidney patients, but essentially um, what you end up doing is losing that negative charge over time. And then if you lose that negative charge, now some of those larger molecules, those proteins can actually get through. And so if you see a patient with proteinuria or protein in the urine, that could be one of those signs that that's actually occurring there. They're losing that negative charge on the basement membrane. Okay, so it's really, really important to maintain that to make sure we're holding on to proteins appropriately. And then anything getting through the glomerulus, uh, through Bowman's capsule, is going to be called filtrate at that point. So you notice here it's going to be exiting out uh, through uh, the proximal convoluted tubule first, and coming into the afferent arterial, getting filtered, and then eventually leading to the efferent arterial. What do you think happens to renal blood flow if I dilate this vessel here? Increase, decrease? Yeah, it's actually going to increase, right? So this is going to be important when we're looking at renal blood flow, uh, how we can affect that by either constricting or dilating this vessel. What do you think happens if I constrict this vessel? Is it going to decrease filtration, increase it? Actually increases it. One of the things you're going to see is that uh, if you think about the, the kidneys kind of like a garden hose, um, if you kind of pinch off the garden hose, what happens to the pressure of the water kind of coming into it? You have more back pressure, right? So what you end up finding is you constrict this vessel a little bit, and we'll look at some of the things that do that. It actually causes further, higher pressure here and causes more filtration to happen. We'll look at that more in detail in just a second, but just um, keep in mind these differentials in pressure, um, hydrostatic pressure, are going to be really, really important in causing filtration to occur. Okay, This is why if you have a really hypotensive patient who has very low blood pressure, you don't have a lot of pressure coming into these afferent arterioles, and that uh, works to decrease the actual filtration that happens. Okay, So that can be a problem you see in some of our hypotensive patients. But... Um, looking at different substances and how their molecular weight stacks up with their filterability. Uh, basically, uh, a value of one here would indicate that something gets freely filtered, it would cross no problem. Um, so water would be a good example of this. Pretty small molecular weight, able to cross very easily. Um, sodium, similarly can get across very easily. Glucose, inulin, inulin's a, a, um, something we're going to talk about a little bit later. It's one of the things we can use to actually help us um, determine renal function. Um, but you yeah, have things like myoglobin. My, what is, what's myoglobin? It's a muscle protein, holds on to oxygen right in the muscle, so myoglobin. Um, you typically don't want myoglobin to, to get excreted out into the kidneys because you can run into problems um, where if that precipitates out, it can cause uh, kidney failure. So if you think about someone who has um, rhabdomyolysis, so imagine someone's like working out way too hard, you know, they never worked out a day in their life, and they go and they try to squat 300 pounds, um, they can develop rhabdomyolysis where they get all this myoglobin. Um, and eventually you can overwhelm these uh, the capability of things like that negative charges or the size of these pores. Because if I have a ton of myoglobin in the system, uh, it doesn't matter how small these fenestrations are, it can still force its way through. And then you can have myoglobin out in the urine. So that's where, uh, if you ever hear, uh, if someone is, says they have rhabdo, what color is their urine typically? Yeah, it looks like, like iced tea or something. Like it's really um, it's dark brown color. Uh, if you ever hear that, someone's like, yeah, I worked out and now my urine's brown they should go to the emergency department immediately because they're at risk for having this kidney failure due to having all these proteins here. And then albumin is another big one. Again, a very large protein here, lots of negative charges, not very filterable at all. Okay. And again, we want to keep albumin in the bloodstream because that is going to be providing some uh, colloidal pressure, as we'll see in just a second. Okay. Um, again, looking at filtration and secretion, so we have a couple of different uh, examples of things that can happen here. Um, so when something gets filtered, uh, in uh, situation A here, we're going to have filtration only. Um, a substance is basically going to be freely filtered out of the glomerulus, uh, but you're going to find it neither gets reabsorbed or secreted. Okay. So something like creatinine is a good example of this, where it gets secreted out through the glomerulus. It's going to go through here, and it never gets reabsorbed um, with those paratubular capillaries. Right? That vasa recta is never going to reabsorb creatinine. Um, this is going to be useful for things where we want to measure actual uh, kidney function, and we'll go over that a little bit later. Uh, so, uh, situation B, this is going to be something that gets filtered, but only gets partially reabsorbed. So for instance, you can have something like sodium or chloride uh, that, you know, if you were to measure someone's urine do your analysis, you should find some sodium in there, uh, but not all of the sodium that was filtered. And that's because a lot of it ends up getting reabsorbed. Okay, so you can see it'll get filtered out through the glomerulus and get reabsorbed here through the paratubular capillaries. Okay, which is an important process. We want that to happen. Otherwise, if you lost all your sodium out the urine, you have any tree make, you got seizures, it's no, no good, right? Looking at situation C, this is something uh, that is filtered but completely reabsorbed. Um, so basically, it gets freely filtered here, the glomerulus, it would come through, but then you almost find nothing of it in the urine because all of it gets reabsorbed. 
So this is really important for things like uh, glucose. We want to reabsorb glucose. We don't want to have a lot of glucose in the urine. Um, amino acids will do this as well, so the kind of protein breakdown. Really shouldn't find a lot of protein or amino acids in the urine. That's because it ends up getting reabsorbed. Now, is this going to be, uh, you know, if I keep increasing the glucose concentration, it gets excreted through glomerulus. Like, can I ever overwhelm this process? 100%, right? So that's when you have something like uncontrolled diabetes. One of the things you're looking for in your analysis is going to be glucose in the urine, right? That can be a good sign of that. They're filtering so much glucose, so they overwhelm that capability. So we'll talk about transport maximums a little bit later as well. And then finally, um, for substance uh, or situation D, you know, things that are freely filtered, uh, they don't get absorbed, but you could have actual additional amounts of it secreted into the substance. So even though you, if you were to measure the concentration here outside the glomerulus versus here in the urine, you know, it's going to be much higher. And that's because you're actively secreting it through those paratubular capillaries into the urine there. Okay. So again, sometimes you're going to find that this is due to special transporters. Um, they're there. We're talking about the different ones that can uh, transport anions versus cations, um, but these are typically due to transporters are moving this across. Okay. All right. Again, I mentioned the afferent arteria is going to enter uh, the Bowman's capsule, and then usually what you're going to find filtered here most often is going to be sodium, water, glucose, um, urea gets filtered here as well. That kind of breakdown of uh, proteins, um, bicarbonate, chloride creatinine, calcium, uh, also uh, other amino acids are going to filter here as well. And again, all come through that afferent arterial and again filter it out uh, through those fenestrations and through those, those pores. Okay, so you notice um, that you can have uh, varying amounts of this stuff being reabsorbed at any given time. So for instance, glucose, um, you know, and again, we, we filter uh, blood through the kidney several, several times throughout the day, right? Because we want to keep uh, filtering that constantly. And so you filter a lot of glucose throughout the body uh, throughout the day. And so you notice you really shouldn't find, for a healthy patient, any glucose in the urine. That's because even though we filter a lot of it, we're going to reabsorb almost all of it, okay? Um, you're going to find it's not the case for some other substances, but things like bicarb, usually we want to hold on to bicarb because that's going to be useful to keeping the pH neutral, um, or at least normal for us. Uh, sodium gets mostly reabsorbed, chloride mostly gets reabsorbed. Obviously things like urea, which is a waste product, we probably want to get rid of that, right? So we're going to actually um, have a little bit of that gets reabsorbed. We'll look at why that is. Um, a lot of this has to do with helping to... Um, uh, help with like concentration in the urine. We'll look at some other examples of that. Um, but urea uh, mostly gets eliminated, about half of it does. And then creatinine, notice here, none of it gets reabsorbed, and we're going to lose all of that within the urine. Okay. Again, don't memorize these numbers, just know the, the kind of the concepts. And we'll talk about kind of major things as far as uh, what gets reabsorbed where in a little bit. Okay, uh, we mentioned that uh, as far as like proteins, blood cells, and other non-filtered solutes, so again, you're going to still have some water. Not everything gets filtered out of, of the, the blood here, but you're just going to have some water, some sodium, some other small solutes. They're going to be exiting that efferent arterial, um, and you're going to notice that uh, because of that, we're going to talk about increased colloidal pressure and then reduced hydrostatic pressure. Basically, what that means is, is that as the blood is coming into the afferent arterial, we're losing a lot of fluid, we're losing a lot of solutes. That's going to reduce the hydrostatic pressure, right? Uh, as we're coming through here, we're also getting those proteins and things that don't get um, that don't get secreted are going to be uh, concentrated, right? Because there's going to be less uh, blood volume there, so it's going to be concentrated, and so you're going to see that the actual colloidal pressure or the pressure due to those proteins is going to increase as you leave the efferent arterial. That sounds like it doesn't make uh, or it sounds like it's not super important. We'll find out why that is important in just a minute. So basically, looking at the, the direction of blood flow, again, coming this direction here through uh, afferent and eventually to the efferent, um, you're kind of having several different pressures that are uh, either helping filtration or impeding it. Okay? Um, one thing that would help to increase filtration is going to be hydrostatic pressure. Okay? Because again, that fluid pressure is going to be pressing outwards, is going to be pressing the fluids through. Right? So that's actually the main thing that helps uh, the filter there. On the other hand, you're going to have glomerular colloidal pressure this is due to proteins and things like albumin uh, that are going to be left over in the blood. These are going to try to hold on to fluids, right? So uh, basically it's providing uh, that solute in the blood to try to draw water into it, to try to you know, maintain that, that osmosis there. Uh, but basically this is providing an impeding pressure here. So for instance, if I were to have decreased proteins in the blood as it gets filtered, what do you think this would do to the actual amount of, of plasma being filtered? Increase or decrease? You have decreased pressure here, so that would increase the amount that's impeded and you'd have uh, basically more flow here. So you'd end up losing maybe too much fluid, 
right? That's a problem we run into when you have patients who um, have low albumin stores. They tend to not hold on to fluid quite so well, and they end up uh, either excreting it too much or they end up uh, having a third space outside of the vasculature. Um, so that's the one thing why we might give someone albumin to try to hold on to more of that fluid in the blood. And basically it provides better colloidal pressure here, okay? The other thing um, you have to consider that is impeding filtration is going to be this Bowman's capsule pressure. And notice here it's going to be kind of additive. So the net filtration pressure is around 10 millimeters of mercury. That's a, a, going to be on the outward side, it's kind of flowing out of the glomerulus. So you're going to notice that glomerular hydrostatic pressure is the main kind of positive force here to, to push filtration, uh, which is going to be impeded by Bowman's capsule pressure, right? the hydrostatic pressure, uh, and then this glomerular oncotic pressure or this colloidal pressure. Okay, It's all going to be related back to those uh, serum proteins and whatnot. Everyone with me so far? And you can think about it like, you know, if I were to, say, um, dilate this afferent arterial, what do you think that would do to hydrostatic pressure? Increase or decrease it? Should go up, right? Because if, if I dilate this vessel and have more blood flow coming in, that's going to lead to more hydrostatic pressure pushing out. And that's going to lead to better filtration, okay? So, for instance, you know, if I were to have... Um, you know, increased blood volume. If I drank, you know, two liters of water, um, that would increase the amount of blood flow coming in. That would increase the hydrostatic pressure, so I can get rid of that extra water. Right. So that'd be one situation where that might occur. Uh, versus, on the other hand, if I were to die, or if I were to constrict this vessel, what do you think that would do to the hydrostatic pressure? It should also go up, right? Because I'm impeding flow here. It's basically kind of putting a kink in the hose, and that would also increase that filtration uh, fraction there. Okay. And so we're going to see there's several different hormones that are involved in either dilating or constricting these vessels um, that can be involved in regulating that pressure. Okay. Okay, so uh, roughly looking at GFR is glomerular filtration rate. Uh, it's a volume of filtrate that gets produced by both the kidneys uh, and each minute. So roughly when you're looking at GFR for a patient, for a healthy patient, it should be roughly 115 to 125 mLs per minute, uh, which equates to approximately 180 liters uh, filtered through in a day. Okay, so again, a lot more blood being filtered through than what we actually need, but it's good because it helps keep uh, in clear waste products and whatnot. We shouldn't excrete roughly about one liter of urine per day, but this is going to vary pretty wildly uh, based on how much fluid you're intaking, uh, how much waste products you need to get rid of. Um, but roughly about a liter a day is, is uh, usually enough to uh, keep most people kind of on a, on a neutral kind of fluid balance. And you can see that you know the total blood volume gets filtered about 40 uh, in about 40 minutes. So again, about 36 times a day, we're filtering the entire blood circulation uh, to clean it up, get it ready for um, you know, picking up new waste products and, 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 and functioning. And basically, uh, you can calculate GFR by looking at things like the volume of urine uh, that gets made per minute, and then multiplying that by the concentration of the substance in the urine, right? So actually what gets filtered, and dividing that by the plasma uh, concentration of that substance, right? So essentially what you're saying is, is that uh, with a higher GFR, that means you're either producing more urine, or you're finding a higher concentration of that, that substance in the urine, uh, and you're finding a lower concentration within the plasma. So if I'm filtering it out of the blood, it's not going to be there to be measured later on, okay? Um, I'm not going to make you do any calculations based off of this, but just um, we're talking about like creatinine and inulin a little bit later on. This is going to come up again uh, to see um, how this is going to differ based on things that are reabsorbed versus being secreted. But this is essentially how you kind of figure out GFR. All right, so we're going to continue uh, talking about reabsorption and secretion of different uh, substances in the, uh, in the kidney, in the different parts of the renal tubule. So uh, reabsorption is going to be that return of the filtered molecules from the blood. Um, uh, basically, uh, after, once they've gotten filtered through the glomerulus, uh, to get filter, uh, reabsorbed back into the blood, I should say. And we mentioned the 180 liters of water uh, end up getting filtered per day, but maybe we only approximately have one liter that actually gets excreted as urine. Um, and so you're going to find that you know this will increase uh, the patient very well hydrated. Uh, and should decrease if the patient dehydrated, right? So um, you're going to find there's always going to be a minimal amount of urine that you have to produce. It's, kind of, it's called this obligatory urine loss, uh, and that's based on the fact that we can only maximally concentrate our urine so much. Um, basically, we can see that urine osmolality can range anywhere between 50 milliatoms per liter all the way up to a maximum of 1,200 milliatoms per liter. You guys remember what blood is normally sitting at? It's like 280 to 300 ish, um, somewhere in that range, right? So that's the usual blood osmolality. So you can see you can get very dilute compared to that, 
right? Six times more dilute, or you can get uh, much, much more concentrated, uh, up to like 1,200 uh, milliawatts per liter. Obviously, you know, you can find certain animals that have um, much higher abilities to concentrate uh, urine. There's uh, the book talked about. It's like Australian mouse that lives out in the desert um, that uh, is able to concentrate his urine to like 10,000 milliawatts per liter and is able to excrete very, very small amounts of urine and that way hold on to more uh, since he can't find a lot of, a lot of water, right? But for us, um, we can only do a maximum of 1,200 uh, milliosms per liter. A lot of it has to do with this backflow of ions that we'll talk about in just a second. Um, but when I mentioned that obligatory urine loss, essentially 500 mLs needs to be excreted roughly every day, um, even if you're in the most dehydrated state. And the reason for that is, is because we need to be able to get rid of roughly, uh, you know, that 1,200 milliosms, or about, I'm um, sorry, uh, about 600 milliosms of waste products every day, right? So about a half a liter would equal about, uh, if we were maximum concentrating, it would be roughly 600 mL of waste products. Usually like urea is going to be one of the primary ones there. Okay. So looking at uh, the, the renal tubule, you'll notice here, here's a paratubular capillary. This is going to be the, the kind of the basolateral side. This is going to be the apical side uh, of things this is where the filtration is happening. Here's the, the kind of the lumen of the renal tubule. And you notice these tubular cells, right? And this is where a lot of the reabsorption actually is going to be occurring through. Now, there's several pathways that the uh, ions can take and, and different products can take to re be reabsorbed. Some of it can happen through passive processes. Some of it will be through active processes. And then we're even going to talk about a secondary active process in just a few minutes, right? So to further complicate things. Some things can get through what we call these paracellular pathways where they can actually go uh, between the cells. And as, and again, things are going to try to flow from an area of high concentration to low concentration, right? Or try to go to uh, dilute things out there in a high concentration. So for instance, um, we talked about the paratubular capillaries. We mentioned that uh, as the hydrostatic pressure decreases as uh, blood is flowing out of the efferent arterioles, we mentioned that colloidal pressure is uh, increasing or decreasing. Those proteins are gonna get more concentrated, so it should go up, right? So that colloidal pressure is gonna be drawing water and other molecules into it. So because the paratubular capillaries are already going to be more concentrated and have that higher colloidal pressure, we're going to see that this is going to uh, lead to kind of having a bulk flow of stuff going back into the paratubular capillaries, right? It's trying to draw more water into it, essentially. And again, salt and water are going to be heading together uh, in a lot of cases. We'll see where that uh, differs. But in general, where salt goes, water wants to go as well. There's also some transcellular pathways. Again, some of this can be passive diffusion through the cells uh, back into the uh, back into the blood supply. Some of it can be through actual active processes. So you can see here that the kidneys require uh, quite a bit of oxygen uh, in order to maintain its metabolic activity, right? And a lot of it has to do with these active transporters here, okay? We're gonna see sodium is gonna be a big one. Uh, having active transport of sodium via the sodium potassium ATPase pump is gonna be a major utiliza uh, utilizer of oxygen and ATP. That's gonna cause sodium to be spit back out into the paratubular capillaries. And then what's gonna be on the countercurrent side of that? So the sodium potassium ATPase pump, potassium, right? So sodium is going to go out, it's going to bring potassium into these cells. And so it's important to remember um, that's also going to be going on here. So again, some things will be passively diffused, some things are going to be more actively uh, causing transport here. And then again, water for the most part is going to be traveling via osmosis. So as I'm transporting more and more sodium uh, and other solutes into the paratubular capillaries, that again is increasing that uh, the, the osmolarity that's going to draw more water along with it as well, right? Just via simple osmosis. Okay. And then whatever does not get reabsorbed gets excreted, and we'll find some places where things can actually be secreted uh, into the, the lumen there as well. Okay, everyone with me? All right. So uh, looking at the kidneys, they use about two times the oxygen on a gram per gram basis as the brain, uh, and they're also getting quite a bit more blood flow than the brain does as well. It's about seven times more, uh, which means that we have a lot of... Uh, reserve, which is good, uh, which also means we have some room to play with. So if a patient has um, somewhat diminished renal blood flow, hopefully they're still getting enough oxygen there to uh, prevent damage, right? Because as soon as you stop giving oxygen to the kidneys, they start getting hypoxic damage, and that's where you can get uh, acute kidney injury that can happen there. If you are an AKI, that's acute kidney injury. And so you'll notice here that uh, a lot of the energy utilization is based on how much sodium we're reabsorbing based on that sodium potassium pump. Uh, you can notice here that the kidneys are going to have some, you know, kind of basal oxygen consumption. Uh, the other cells are going to be utilizing. Um, but a lot of it, uh, the energy utilization comes about from uh, as you increase more sodium reabsorption, utilizing more ATP at that pump, and thus you're going to be requiring more um, oxygen uh, to be generated you know, with glucose and all of that to, to form uh, ATP, right? 
Uh, again, looking at the, the flow of sodium sp uh, specifically, because this is what one of the major ions being uh, filtered and what uh, is being um, reabsorbed here. You can see that, again, sodium, some of it can be going through uh, the kind of transcellular pathway. Some of it's been going, uh, going through um, kind of passive diffusion into the cell. And then the sodium potassium pump is going to be really important for sending sodium out into the, the lumen here of the, the blood vessel, right? So we're bringing more potassium in. Um, you can also have another transporter here on kind of this, uh, this other side of it, which will also lead to some sodium being excreted here, most of which is going to be reabsorbed for the most part. Um, now, by causing active transport of sodium outside of the cell, into the paratubular capillary, you're also decreasing the amount of intracellular uh, sodium, which is going to uh, further enhance this uh, reabsorption of sodium as well, right? So sodium is going to be in a higher concentration in the lumen. If it's in a low intracellular concentration, it's going to cause the shift to go into the cell, and then it can be utilized by the sodium potassium pump to send it back into the blood flow, okay? That's one way that we can have a lot of sodium being reabsorbed. Again, um, when we're talking about, uh, especially with the, the proximal convoluted tubule, the first place uh, that you get to after the uh, glomerulus, uh, we're going to see a lot of sodium absorption happening there and a lot of water reabsorption. So probably about 65% of the reabsorption is going to be happening there right there in the, in the proximal convoluted tubule. Okay. Also by keeping um, a very kind of uh, higher negative voltage here, this also is going to lead for, uh, also kind of provide a stimulus for sodium to cross over since it has a positive charge and wants to kind of even out this differential here in voltage, uh, which is maintained by having that sodium potassium pump being sending out three sodium while only bringing in two potassium. Remember that? So three sodiums get transported for every two potassium they get brought in. All right. So um, looking at reabsorption, so this is kind of the normal process that's occurring here. And again, you're, we're talking about colloidal pressure and also as hydrostatic pressure as well. So essentially what we can see is that increased hydrostatic pressure is going to impede flow from the tubular lumen back into the paratubular capillary versus this colloidal pressure is going to be drawing things into it, right? So this is kind of the exact opposite to the filtration that we saw uh, in the glomerulus, okay? So again, when you have a lot of that fluid being uh, filtered out the glomerulus, you're increasing those oncotic pressures from those proteins, which is leading this to have a net uh, try to have a net effect of causing more things to be sent in, right? We said the net uh, filtration pressure was around 10 millimeters of mercury. Here we have a net reabsorption pressure of around 10 millimeters of mercury here, okay? Of course, this is being impeded both by the, the proteins that are in the interstitial fluid and also the hydrostatic pressure, but ultimately there's a net flow of water and other solutes back into the paratubular capillary, okay? Again, if you did not have enough serum proteins, if you were to say deficient in albumin, uh, this hydrostatic pressure would be lower, I'm sorry, the colloidal pressure would be lower, and that would lead to less reabsorption of water. And then it just gets, uh, you know, it just gets uh, never reabsorbed, it gets lost in the urine, and then you can be dehydrated, okay? So this is why having those proteins is really important. It's important to maintain that colloidal pressure, okay? So um, for instance, if you were in, so this is the normal kind of circumstance where again, the sodium is, uh, uh, potassium pump is causing reabsorption of sodium. Uh, it's causing this to be more negative, causing the, to lose more intracellular sodium, which is causing kind of a net flow of sodium to travel this direction into the paratubular capillary. Now, for instance, if you were to have an issue, say you were to have uh, too high of a pressure, uh, the hydrostatic pressure was too high, say blood volume was too elevated, um, that would impede flow of water and solutes back into the capillaries. If you had too low colloidal pressure, that would also impede that as well. Okay, So this would end up leading to decreased reabsorption of water. Um, and when you have that decreased reabsorption, there's also uh, some backflow that can actually happen here as well, right? So again, we can only maintain such a high concentration differential. Uh, and so when you end up having uh, too much, uh, you know, say sodium on this side, uh, and none of it's being reabsorbed, you're gonna have backflow back into the lumen as well. Okay, so that flow can kind of happen either direction, depending on how the concentration differentials are occurring there, okay? And this is also gonna be important as to why uh, we can only maximally concentrate the urine so much. A lot of it has to do with that differential in, in sodium concentrations, which we'll see in just a few minutes, okay? So, um, and then referring back to that secondary active transport, this is essentially transport that's occurring um, secondary to the active transport that's already happened here. So a good example of this would be on the absorption side, would be when you have the sodium potassium pump leading to uh, lowered intracellular sodium concentrations here, you're gonna notice there's this like SGLT transporter that is responsible for removing sodium and glucose. Now, because we use energy here to move sodium outside of the cell, this is gonna stimulate this one here because lower sodium intracellular concentrations, it's gonna stimulate increased uh, influx of sodium and glucose, right? Same thing can happen here with the amino acids as well. So by having a lowered 
uh, by using an active process to lower the amount of sodium in here, this is causing more influx of, of other substances as well, right, through those co-transporters. So even though this is passive, it's relying on that differential created by the active transport, okay? So that's on the adsorption side. On the other end, you can have excretion occurring here as well. So here's an example where um, having this co uh, counter transporter, you can have sodium being brought in, secondary to that active transport out of the cell, and this is can actually secrete hydrogen ions. Right, so that would help to acidify the urine, uh, help us to maintain our sodium our, uh, acid base balance. So just know, secondary active transport is a, is a passive process itself, but relies on uh, the the different the change that occurred due to the active transport. Okay, this is actually an interesting uh, transporter here. We actually have new drugs that can uh, inhibit this, and we use it for um, diabetic patients. Because again, if I'm not in, if I'm impeding the amount of glucose reabsorption in the kidneys or in the nephrons, I don't really reabsorb it back into the bloodstream and then you just pee it right out. All right, so that's actually one way we can actually affect that um, to help our patients with diabetes. Um, what do you think happens in the urinary tract when you have a ton of extra sugar though? What loves to eat sugar? Bacteria and also fungus. Um, so one of the side effects of this drug by inhibiting um, the reabsorption of glucose and it all being in the urine is fungal UTIs or urinary tract infection. So uh, kind of an unintended consequence of that. It's really good at lowering your blood sugar. Also, you're going to get a fungal urinary tract infection, which is no good. Um, so again, just kind of showing you some, some things to come in as far as pharmacology goes. Okay. So there's always going to be a maximum amount of things that you can be transporting because, again, these are all saturable processes for the most part. Um, you're going to notice that it can range pretty wildly. So, for instance, with glucose, we can max, uh, maximally transport something like 375 milligrams per minute. If you had a patient who had, say, diabetic ketoacidosis and they had very high blood sugars um, or they had uncontrolled type 2 diabetes, they would be in a, uh, filtering all of that glucose still because the uh, glucose is freely filtered. Um, but you'd find that you'd uh, basically saturate those transporters to reabsorb it. So what would happen if you were looking to say, here's the glucose filtered, uh, the load, uh, and then the reabsorption uh, amount uh, or excretion, which we'll look at the different lines here, and then the actual plasma glucose concentration. Normally, if you're sitting around 100, right, so 100 milligrams per deciliter, um, everything that gets filtered out should be reabsorbed. Okay? As I start to increase that, you're going to increase the amount that's actually getting filtered. So again, this can kind of increase um, to infinity, essentially. Um, so as that keeps going up, you're going to notice that the amount that actually gets excreted in the urine is going to start to kind of increase here. And eventually you're going to overload the amount of glucose you can actually reabsorb and all of this is going to spill out into the urine. So that's one of the things you can do is look at a urinalysis, look for glucose in the urine and that can tell you, okay, yes, they are oversaturating uh, the uh, ability for the transporters to reabsorb glucose and now it's spilling out in the urine. Okay? Or you can taste it and you'll be like, oh, that's really sweet. So what they used to do before we had urinalysis. I wouldn't recommend it doing it now, but um, you can always do that. Okay, uh, again, uh, things like phosphate, sulfate, amino acids, so you can end up having too many amino acids and, and uh, being filtered and not re reabsorbing all those. Um, creatinine, we mentioned, uh, again, is gonna have a little bit of reabsorption, but for the most part does not get reabsorbed, which is important when we talk about creatinine clearance a little bit later on. So again, um, filtration, the initial step when it's coming out of the glomerulus, that reabsorption, we're going to look more into detail on where different things are being reabsorbed in the tubule in just a minute. So first thing we'll talk about is going to be the proximal convoluted tubule, PCT. Um, this area is responsible for a lot of reabsorption of substances. Uh, it has a large number of mitochondria, able to generate a lot of ATP to keep those sodium potassium pumps functioning um, pretty much uh, consistently. Uh, they also uh, possess a brush border. So if you guys uh, can think, what's a brush border? It's a lot of those like little microvilli, right? Remember those little kind of extensions off the cell? Um, what does that do for us? It's all surface area, right? So you can increase surface area. That allows for better reabsorption uh, to occur because you can uh, basically cover all those little microvilli with more... Um, you know, more transporters and things like that. So it really helps with the reabsorption uh, process here. And so again, about 65% of that sodium is being actively transported out of the filtrate by that sodium potassium pump, right? So sodium potassium is sending things back into that paratubular capillaries and it's causing kind of a vacuum or kind of a sucking effect of getting that sodium into that cell and then can be acted on by that transporter again, right? Um, this also means that uh, really within the proximal tubule, you're gonna find that water gets reabsorbed at the same rate essentially as sodium does. 
And so that means the osmolality or osmolarity here, again, I'm, I'm gonna use the two interchangeably, um, they're gonna end up being very similar. So if we uh, end up kind of uh, filtering out the, the blood here and we get roughly, you know, say osmolality of say 300 milliliters per liter, it's gonna stay the same throughout this proximal convoluted tubule. Even though sodium is being reabsorbed, Water is going at the same rate essentially, and so it's maintaining a very similar osmolality, um, even though some other things are getting concentrated, right? So you're starting to get urea and whatnot it's starting to be concentrated there. A lot of bicarb gets reabsorbed here, which is important. If you're not um, reabsorbing bicarb, that can lead to a urinary alkalosis, which can lead to uh, metabolic acidosis, right? So if you lose all your bicarb, you can't buffer the system appropriately. Um, this is actually where a certain class of uh, diuretics work called carbonic and hydrase inhibitors. We'll look at that a little bit later in this section, um, see how those work. Again, essentially, as long as you're not overloading the transporters, 100% amino acids and glucose should be reabsorbed here at the proximal convoluted tubule, okay? Uh, and then about 50% of the urea gets reabsorbed as well. The rest of it's going to be sent out uh, and, and eventually uh, collected in the urine. Okay. So I kind of like these pictures. You kind of see what the kind of the morphology of these cells look like uh, in the different areas. So again, around 65% or so are going to be reabsorbed uh, of most of your solutes and things like that. 100% uh, glucose, 100% amino acids, and around 65% water and, and, and sodium. You kind of see what's being reabsorbed here. Um, you'll also notice there's going to be some secretion uh, of things into the tubule as well. Certain things are not going to be able to be freely filtered at the glomerulus, and so uh, especially large molecules or the molecules that have those negative charges. And so there's special transporters that can be utilized to actually uh, secrete uh, some of these molecules into uh, the, the renal tubule. We'll show some examples of that in just a minute. But this is a good uh, slide or a good graph kind of showing you the, the tubular fluid uh, divided by the plasma concentration. Um, so basically this is going to be um, as things dip below one, this means that they get reabsorbed very well. As things start to get above one, that means they're going to be um, in a higher concentration than what you would have at the plasma, right? So it's just, just urine uh, uh, values divided by the plasma values. And this is basically over the proximal length uh, or the length of the proximal tubule. So we mentioned glucose and amino acids, these get reabsorbed almost completely. Right, so about 100% of those should be reabsorbed by the end of there. Um, bicarbonate mostly is going to get reabsorbed. Uh, notice how sodium is going to be pretty steady. So the sodium concentration stays roughly the same uh, because water is leaving at the same rate. So your sodium and your water's uh, concentration stay uh, roughly the same, even though the actual amount is actually going down here. Okay, um, Urea is going to be uh, slightly concentrated, but some of it's still going to be uh, out there. And then creatinine uh, gets uh, very little reabsorption. So you're going to notice they have higher values in the urine now than you would have uh, in the bloodstream. So again, looking at reabsorption in that proximal convoluted tubule, that active transport of sodium is also going to drive other things to be reabsorbed as well. So we already kind of mentioned how amino acids and glucose are going to be reabsorbed based on that secondary active transport, based on that kind of that sodium sink that forms when you have the sodium potassium pump pumping things back into the, into the paratubular capillaries. Um, you're also going to find that uh, this will draw chloride as well. So you're going to find that a lot of that passive absorption of chloride happens here in the proximal convoluted tubule uh, additionally. And you mentioned wherever salt goes, water wants to follow it. So sodium and chloride uh, are going to be uh, being reabsorbed. Water is going to flow by osmosis um, and, and go in a similar concentration. So that way you uh, have the similar osmolarity here, um, despite there being less water and less sodium there. Okay. Again, you can see the fluid is going to be reduced, reduced to about a third of the original volume. Still isoosmotic, it's still roughly about the same as the blood, um, but you're going to notice it's going to be uh, uh, severely reduced as far as volume goes because you've reabsorbed so much of that water, roughly like two thirds or so. So you can just a nice picture, kind of showing you that having that salt reabsorption is going to lead indirectly or uh, lead directly to that H two O reabsorption. Um, that's going to lead to increased luminal concentrations as this would be within the renal tubule itself, um, increased luminal concentration of chloride, increased amounts of urea, and this is going to lead to passive uh, reabsorption of things like urea and chloride. Um, also with that lumen negative charge as that goes up because you're reabsorbing a lot of sodium, right, you're losing a lot of positives, that increased negative in the lumen is going to cause a shift of that chloride into the cell and then eventually be reabsorbed. Okay, so looking at secretion in the uh, proximal convoluted tubule, you see some secretion of hydrogen ions. I mentioned that uh, counter transporter with sodium just a few minutes ago. Um, certain drugs and toxins can also be secreted here as well. And so you'll have specific transporters, uh, many of which I'm not going to go over here, um, but you have certain things like you know organic anion transporters or these oats. Uh, there's also organic cation transporters that will do uh, positively uh, charged molecules. 
And essentially, um, these are able to secrete substances that would otherwise not be filtered at the glomerulus. And so a really good example of this was penicillin. Um, you guys know where penicillin comes from? comes from a mold, right? So you probably have some penicillin growing in somewhere in a deep, dark corner of your fridge somewhere. Um, at least I'm trying to cultivate some myself. Uh, and so what you would see, though, is that penicillin was actually uh, actively secreted into the renal tubule. So it would get excreted, uh, secreted into the renal tubule. Uh, it would lose it in, in the... Um, uh, through the urine, and that was it, right? But it was kind of hard to come by at the time, so they wanted to find some way to let penicillin stick around for longer. So they said, well, what if we did something that blocked that secretion of it and allowed for it to stick around the bloodstream for longer? Now, all of a sudden, you'd have uh, much more bang for your buck out of a single dose of penicillin, which might have been pretty hard to come by at the time, or pretty expensive. So they would use a drug called Provenicid, which um, if you ever look up like drug interactions, like you'll always see Provenicid being listed there, but clinically, we never use it anymore nowadays. Uh, but Essentially, they would use provenicid to block some of those oat transporters to prevent penicillin from being secreted into the renal tubule, and that way it would stick around the bloodstream for longer, killing off your infection. So uh, kind of one way we can use drug interactions to our benefit um, by keeping and, and extending the half-life of a drug, essentially. Okay. Moving on, then we have the loop of Henley. I was thinking about finding a gif of Don Henley from the Eagles, but I uh, figured none of you would get that joke, so I did not do it. Uh, but anywho, uh, we're going to find that there are a couple distinct portions of the loop of Henley uh, that we are going to be um, focusing on, and different uh, flow of ions or water are going to be happening here, depending on where we're looking at. Um, initially, as we leave the proximal convoluted tubule, we're going to be going down to the uh, descending loop of Henley. So all kind of thin all the way down. Um, this is primarily going to be focused on water reabsorption. Okay, mostly water reabsorbed here. Not a whole lot of salt flow at this point. As you loop around, you're going to start to come up the de uh, the ascending loop of Henley, the thin portion. There's a little bit of salt uh, reabsorption happening here. The primary thing, though, the primary mover and shaker is going to be this thick ascending loop of Henley. Okay, this is where you're going to see a lot of reabsorption of sodium chloride. Almost no water gets reabsorbed here. Okay, so that's another important thing. We'll look at this in a second. Um, but you have a lot of reabsorption of different ions. Um, this is also where, have you guys ever heard of loop diuretics or like furosemide or Lasix? This is primarily where this is going to be working at. Okay, um, We'll have some secretion of hydrogen ions, but the main thing here is a lot of salt reabsorption, other solutes, um, but no water reabsorption here. So again, uh, about, we mentioned two thirds or so of the water and the salt get reabsorbed in the proximal convoluted tubule. Notice here that the, uh, the osmolarity of the blood coming in is roughly around 300, we'll say, and it's gonna stay the same roughly all the way throughout the uh, proximal convoluted tubule, all the way until it gets to the, the descending loop of Henle. And notice that this is gonna be kind of in the, uh, the cortex of the, nef uh, the, the kidney, and then we're kind of jutting down deeper and deeper into the medulla, okay? So just kind of keep that positional uh, relationship in mind. Now, because we are losing water here, we're reabsorbing water, notice how the concentration is gonna get higher and higher and higher to get to that kind of maximum of that 1200 milliosms per liter. Okay, remember that was, we were saying that's the maximum amount you could concentrate urine, is 1200 milliosms per liter. Well, basically you can see here is that as you uh, lose that water, things get more and more concentrated. And then as you start to have a uh, loop around, start to come up the, the ascending loop, especially here in the sodium chloride uh, gets reabsorbed in the thick, portion of this, you're going to notice that the uh, osmolarity is going to drop back down. So roughly it's going to actually become hypotonic compared to what it was when it actually uh, got filtered through the glomerulus. Look at why that's important in just a minute. But essentially uh, about 20% of the water gets reabsorbed that descending loop. Uh, it's going to be non-permeable to sodium, but is permeable to water. So a lot of water reabsorption, a lot of concentrating effect uh, that occurs here, right? So notice how we're kind of in the inner medulla, uh, outer medulla, and here's the cortex line kind of uh, delin uh, delineating these different re regions. So again, the filtrate becomes more concentrated the deeper it projects down to the medulla. Uh, again, maximally that 1,200 milliosms per liter is where it'll kind of end up at. I mentioned not every nephron is going to do this. Uh, again, primarily the juxtamedullary nephrons that have that vasorectal are primarily what we're going to be focusing on here because those have the most impact on, on concentrating the urine. So looking at the thin and the thick segments, again, for initially it's going to be the thin segment you hit followed by the thick segment. Um, you're going to notice there's additional sodium, chloride, some potassium, some calcium, even some bicarbonate and mag are all going to be reabsorbed here uh, in the ascending loop of Henle. Um, generally, you're not going to have any water reabsorption that happens here, uh, so there's no osmosis that happens. Okay. So again, impermeable to water, uh, especially here in the thick ascending loop of Henle. So that's going to lead to uh, having the filtrate becoming uh, more hypotonic 
because we're losing solute now, uh, and get, you get a ton of salt uh, reabsorption here, and you get down to about 100 milliosms per liter. It's now about a third of what we were when we got filtered out. Uh, and this is important because allowing uh, this, uh, getting this more dilute is going to be important. We're trying to, to release diluted urine out. So if we're overhydrated and we want to get rid of uh, a lot of volume but not a lot of solute, this is where we get uh, that dilution effect that occurs here. Because you mentioned how dilute can I make the urine? Probably like 50 milliosms per liter or so. So we're not quite there, but we'll look at how we can get even more dilute in, in, uh, than that in, in just a moment here. All right. So looking at reabsorption within the loop of Henle itself, I mentioned the descending uh, loop. You're going to have uh, a lot of water reabsorption. Here you're going to notice a lot of salt reabsorption. It's going to uh, further dilute out uh, the solution, the filtrate that's there. Um, the main way that this occurs, and this is primarily looking at the thick ascending loop, this is the primary thing that we're concerned about as far as like where drugs work and where we can see a lot of electrolyte shifts. Um, essentially, again, you have the tubular lumen side. So this is going to be actual in the renal tubule. You're going to have the interstitial side, and then you'd have like the uh, vasa recta or the uh, paratubular capillaries sitting on this side here, right? Um, so essentially, what you can see is that by having active sodium transport out of the cell, it's going to lead to less sodium in here. It's going to allow for uh, these transporters to work. We have uh, counter transport of sodium and uh, hydrogen ions, right? And that's a secondary active transport. You're also going to have uh, a lot of influx of sodium, chloride, and potassium. So notice here we're keeping the, the positives and the negatives uh, equaled out because you're having two chlorides for one sodium and one potassium. And that's going to lead to a lot of sodium being reabsorbed, uh, again, to be worked on by the ATP. You have some passive diffusion of potassium here. Um, in general, you're going to have a little bit more on the absorption side uh, than anything else. Uh, and so you can see this is where things like our loop direct are going to be affecting this. So if I inhibit this pump here, where does all that sodium chloride stay? It stays out in the lumen, and then it's going to get just uh, going to get uh, basically sent out through the collecting duct and eventually out through the urine. Um, so this is a big thing. And notice how you're going to end up losing potassium here as well. So one of the common things you run into with patients who are on loop diuretics, hypokalemia is a problem, right? So uh, we'll, we'll talk more about that in some of the interactions in just a moment here. Uh, again, notice how we're going to keep things more on the kind of the negative side here. That's also going to draw some of these ions like magnesium, like calcium, things like that will also be absorbed here. Right? Uh, also, though, the uh, patients who are on loop diuretics can also become hypomagnesemic. Right? So they're losing magnesium um, because if I keep more of the positives out here, um, if I'm decreasing the, the activity, uh, a lot of the solutes going to be out here, a lot of the magnesium, calcium is all going to go along with that. Okay? So someone who's on loop diuretics chronically, they can lose calcium, they lose magnesium, they lose potassium. Um, and again, uh, this is a big deal because uh, if you're giving loop diuretics to a patient, chances are they probably have a heart condition, you can aggravate and cause an arrhythmia. That's one thing you want to uh, be concerned about there. So uh, the reason why we can keep things so concentrated down towards the medulla versus um, higher up towards the cortex is going to be what we call this countercurrent multiplier. This is basically the way that the loop of Henle is able to concentrate uh, things down in the medulla versus keep them uh, more uh, dilute as you kind of travel up closer towards the cortex. So essentially what's happening is we mentioned that the osmolarity of the filtrate coming into uh, the loop of Henle is going to be roughly uh, isoosmotic to the blood, right? So we'll say around 300 milliosms per liter, okay? Notice that the interstitium is going to be the same here. Notice that the uh, ascending loop, if you were to start out with, if you were to kind of uh, start a new system here, uh, would all be the same, okay? So what happens is, is you're going to notice that uh, initially you're going to have the sodium potassium pump leading to more sodium being drawn out of here. So this is going to lead to the solution, the filtrate here being uh, less concentrated, right? Because you're pumping sodium out. We're not losing any water here. We're just getting rid of solute. And it's going to pump it into this interstitium. So now the interstitium is going to be more concentrated because that's a higher salt concentration, right? Well, then that's going to equilibrate with the, the amount of soda, uh, the water here because now the descending limb is only permeable to water. So because uh, the osmosis then wants to go from areas of high concentration, low concentration, that water is going to flow into the interstitium and now things are going to equal out here, right? R roughly equal. So as that water, that filtrate kind of flows through, you're going to notice here that now we're at a, kind of a new point where things are going to be more, uh, more diluted here, more concentrated here. You have this process happen here. And note um, that the maximum difference in sodium ion concentrations you can get is roughly 200, right? So that's why you only see so much of a shift and not like, you know, anything more severe. Once you get high enough, uh, higher than 200, usually you're going to have some backflow of ions uh, that prevents that from getting any more concentrated. 
So anyway, so you're going to see this gets more dilute because you're pumping more sodium out to the interstitium. Uh, you're going to see this re-equilibration happen here. Uh, and so you're noticing things get more concentrated at the bottom of the loop versus things getting more dilute as you get to the top. If you keep doing this process over and over and over again, eventually we're going to hit our limit to where the uh, even though the isoosmotic filtrate is coming in, that's going to get concentrated then that maximum of 1200 milliosms per liter and it gets more dilute as that sodium gets drawn out of that filtrate to that uh, minimum of about 100 milliosms. Make sense? So this is the process that keeps the medulla uh, very highly osmotic uh, that allows for that concentration of the urine that can occur here. Okay? Everyone's still with me? Everyone asleep? Everyone's probably asleep. That's okay. Um, so then next we have the distal convoluted tubule and so uh, you're going to see some reabsorption of sodium, some chloride, also some calcium that actually happens here along with some water. Okay, um, You're going to find that the kind of the most, um, you're going to get less bang for your buck especially out of like, um, if you're looking at like uh, diuretics that you can use, this is where thiazide diuretics actually work. Um, if you're looking at actual like, urine output, like loop diuretics end up getting a lot more bang for your buck because so much of that sodium, because you know, if you think about it, if you inhibit uh, the sodium pumps, um, that sodium potassium chloride pump in the thick ascending loop of Henley, uh, you know, you have all that 1200 milliosms per liter of water or filtrate coming up and all that's just getting expelled out, right? So all that, uh, you're losing a lot of fluid. This is not gonna be as potent here, uh, but it's also uh, still gonna be important for, for regulating ion flow. But essentially, uh, what you can see is that uh, the sodium potassium pump is still gonna be active here, causing that sodium kind of sink, uh, drawing sodium and chloride together uh, through this pump. And so by inhibiting this with thiazide diuretics, uh, you guys ever heard of HCTZ? That's a common thiazide, it stands for hydrochlorothiazide, that's a common one we'll use. Um, uh, more sodium, more chloride out here, water's gonna follow it and then you get increased urine outflow. So um, the other really important thing, and, and notice here we're talking about the early distal convoluted tube, but you're gonna find that the later DCT is going to be very similar to the collecting duct. Um, we'll, we'll see what those functions are in just a minute. Um, but essentially this early uh, collecting duct, notice how it kind of approximates to the afferent and the efferent arterial. We're going to call this uh, the juxtaglomerular <coughs> complex. Okay, we're talking about this macula densa, um, this is a part, part of this distal tubule. So you kind of notice how you have the afferent arterial bring blood in, efferent taking blood out, and then you notice how the distal convoluted tubule is going to be approximated right here. Okay. This is going to be really important because it helps us to provide feedback control of our GFR and then also our blood flow. So for instance, uh, say for instance I were to uh, be in a state where I had, uh, say, low blood flow. Okay, um, I were to have uh, low blood flow coming, low blood volume in the body, and I'm going to have that uh, affect my renal plasma flow, right? Because I'm going to end up decreasing it because less uh, volume is there to actually get filtered. What that ends up doing, you see more salt and water being reabsorbed in the early parts of the nephron that you end up having a lowered amount of uh, sodium chloride here. The kidneys detect that and say, hey, there's not enough sodium chloride here. We should go ahead and increase our volume. So we can do things like increase uh, the diameter of the afferent arterial or vasodilate it. That can increase plasma flow. Sometimes it'll lead to things like the efferent arterial being affected. And this is mainly where renin gets uh, involved, right? So the renin angiotensin system, renin is the primary thing that gets released here that can affect uh, this renal blood flow. So it's super, super important uh, for uh, helping to maintain uh, blood pressure and also renal uh, plasma flow. So um, we'll talk more about those hormones a little bit later on in, in the lecture. But uh, essentially, the next portion is going to be known as this diluting segment of the distal convoluted tubule. Again, it's going to work very similarly um, to uh, basically the, the collecting duct for the most part. Um, you're going to see this is going to be impermeable to water and urea, so no real reabsorption there. But you will absorb some sodium, some potassium, and some chloride here. So it helps to kind of um, get that... Um, ways to dilute out uh, the urine a little bit more there. Uh, and you're going to find that it's going to be very similar to the collecting tubule, which we'll see is going to be important when we're talking about um, water reabsorption as well. So again, uh, you guys remember the main thing that helps with water reabsorption? The diuretic hormone, absolutely. So this is where this is going to start to uh, play a role here. Uh, so you're again, starting to see some sodium chloride uh, 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 being reabsorbed here, but um, antidiuretic hormone is going to be really important here is helping with those um, helping with the water reabsorption. Um, there's a couple of different types of cells here which we're going to look at in, in more detail, but there's the principal cells, which would be responsible for one type of reabsorption, and then there's going to be these intercalated cells as well. So we'll look at those in more detail in just a minute. Okay. A lot of slides here, but essentially what you're going to see that um, the diluting segment, again, I mentioned is impermeable to water and urea. Um, Looking at the principal cells, you can start to see um, kind of what the effects are happening here. And have you guys ever heard of potassium sparing diuretics? 
this is where these are going to play a role here. So basically, potassium sparing would mean you're going to hold on to more potassium, right? It's, it's implied in the name. Um, so you can see that you know those principal cells could be responsible for having um, some degree of potassium uh, loss. You can notice that. So in order to reabsorb sodium in these principal cells, um, you'd end up having uh, end up losing uh, potassium essentially. So you'd end up holding onto sodium but losing potassium in, in the urine. Uh, you can do a couple different ways to inhibit this, uh, and primarily like aldosterone, which we mentioned, uh, is important for doing what to blood volume. To increase it, decrease it. It should increase it, right? So it tries to hold on to more water. Uh, the, way, the way that works is that it actually helps to stimulate the sodium potassium pump. By aldosterone affecting this, you're uh, absorbing more sodium, more water is going to go with it eventually, uh, and thus you can end up having higher blood volume, help to fix your blood pressure issues. So if I were to inhibit that, this process here, if I inhibit this pump, there's less potassium coming into the cell, there's less potassium to leave it. So that's one way you could do it by antagonizing the aldosterone receptors. So if you ever heard of like a spironolactone or a pluralin, those are main ones we use that actually inhibit uh, aldosterone's effects at those receptors. Um, additionally, there's a couple of drugs like amiloride or triamterine, which can actually be used to inhibit uh, the sodium uh, uh, transport here. So you kind of lose that, that um, passive uh, sodium flow, uh, and that's going to inhibit that potassium outflow, right, to keep things balanced. Uh, so that's why I call them potassium sparing diuretics, so you end up holding on to more potassium. On the flip side, um, you're going to have these uh, intercalated cells. There's type A and there's type B. These are really responsible for uh, a lot of uh, acid base management. Um, you're going to notice that uh, CO2 can be absorbed kind of passively through these cells. We mentioned CO2 gets, you know, crosses lipid bilayers pretty easy. Um, so you get CO2 in here. Uh, note, what enzyme do you think catalyzes this reaction? As yeah, so a carbonic anhydrase uh, can be formed here to form, you know, bicarbonate and hydrogen ions um, that can then be reabsorbed. And you'll notice that also um, uh, uh, hydrogen ions will be secreted here. This is an active process, but you're going to lose some hydrogen ions. So if you were in a more acidotic state, you would see increased activity of these type A cells because you'd reabsorb more uh, bicarbonate and you end up losing more hydrogen ions. On the flip side of that, you could also have the similar uh, process with type B intercalated cells where this would actually secrete bicarbonate. You now actually have more absorption of hydrogen ions. So if you're too alkalotic and I wanted to get rid of bicarbonate, I could end up reabsorbing those uh, hydrogen ions and kind of balance things out metabolically. Okay. Those are the kind of main differences between type A and type B cells in that distal convoluted tubule, that kind of late segment. All right. Um, looking at the medullary collecting ducts, so this would kind of be the collecting duct further down uh, away from the distal convoluted tubule. This is going to be one of the primary places where water reabsorption is going to be affected by uh, antidiuretic hormone. Okay? So this is going to be the main place where uh, H2O permeability is determined by how high of a level that is. So again, if you're in a dehydrated state, uh, would you be secreting a lot of antidiuretic hormone or not much? Dehydrated you'd have a lot of antidiuretic hormone, right? Because you want to hold on to as much volume as you can. And the way that's going to work is based on uh, these aquaporin channels we've kind of alluded to previously. Essentially, again, here's the tubular side. Here's going to be the renal interstitial. Arginine vasopressin or antidiuretic hormone can affect these V2 receptors, uh, basically vasopressin type 2 receptors. Um, you'll notice that you have a demylate cyclase being activated here. So you have a secondary messenger. You have to remember that. Okay. Um, so cyclic AMP can be formed. These protein kinases uh, being activated, and that will cause uh, exocytosis, uh, essentially, of these different aquaporin channels. Once these are out here, allows for passive water absorption, um, which can then be reabsorbed uh, back into the uh, paratubular capillaries. Okay. So if I were to have very little antidiuretic hormone activity, say I was overhydrated, I drank a ton of water, uh, I had very little activity here, a lot of these aquaporins would stay within the cell, and thus I would have relative impermeable uh, uh, passage of water here. Okay. So this is what either is going to lead to that eventual final uh, concentration or dilution of the urine. So if I were to, uh, say, have uh, something block these vasopressin receptors, okay, what would that do to my aquaporin channels? They'd all stay intracellularly, and so what would that do to the urine? Make it more or less concentrated? Less concentrated, right? Because then I'm not absorbing as much water, so it's going to stay uh, very dilute for the most part, right? And that can increase the urine outflow. Versus if I were in a state where I had high amounts of arginine vasopressin, say for instance, uh, I had SIADH, or that syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, um, you can end up having way too many of these aquaporin channels on the side here, uh, uh, reabsorbing water, and then what would that do to the urine concentrations? Should cause it to be more concentrated because I'm absorbing more water, so that would end up having very concentrated urine being uh, expelled, right? So I'm reabsorbing all that water, it just concentrates everything. 
Okay. So again, that's one of the things you'll look at when you're trying to evaluate a patient with, say, hyponatremia or if they're having any kind of kidney issues, you're looking at things like, well, what's the urine sodium versus, say, what, and the urine osmolarity versus what the plasma osmolarity and plasma sodium is. Look at those comparisons you can try to figure out. Is this like an SIADH happening? Um, you guys heard of diabetes insipidus? A diabetes insipidus where you're basically losing a ton and ton of water, uh, so you're not really reabsorbing anything here. It's all very dilute urine. Um, so you can kind of assess uh, what's going on, how best to treat that based on those kind of lab values. Okay. Um, I think we're going to go ahead and cut it there. That work for you guys? All right, we'll continue on, uh, I guess, uh, Tuesday is when we will make up the end of this, and then we'll start with the GI stuff. I'll get that uploaded uh, probably the next day or so. Thanks. Any questions?